On this special edition of Independent Sources, The Politics of Color, is racial hatred still a potent force in this country? Our entire society is organized based on race. So when it's not the most pressing thing in a situation, it's still present. And the fact that we can't acknowledge that race is always present is part of our denial. That discussion and more coming up on Independent Sources. Welcome to Independent Sources, bringing you news from New York's ethnic and immigrant communities. I'm Gary Pierre Pierre. Many in this country saw the election of the first black president, Barack Obama, as a signal that America was poised to enter a post-racial society that would leave behind a grim history of racial violence and segregation. But a young white man's recent attack on a black congregation in South Carolina and a white woman's story of passing as black has shown that the country is still grappling with the issue. This week, We've gathered a panel of experts to discuss the issue of race in America. In studio, we have Ken Tanabe, founder of Loving Day, an organization that promotes multiracial identity, and Brooklyn College sociologist Dr. Lawrence Johnson. Tamara Winfrey Harris, author of the book The Sisters Are All Right, is joining us via Skype. Thank you. Thank you. You know, this question is, is the conversation about race in this country changing, and if so, how? You know, we're used to defining race according to a few set categories, but according to the 2010 census, we're looking at uh, almost 3% of the U.S. population identifying as more than one race. So that's like 9 million people. Mm -hmm. And according to a Pew Research study in June, we're, those numbers could actually be about double. So we're looking at more like 6.9%, so tens of millions of people identifying as more than one race. So okay. I think that'll add another layer to the conversation okay. and expand what we're talking about. Dr. Johnson, how about that? So, yeah. the, so the issue is no longer just black and white. Uh, is that changing the conversation? Well, I don't think the issue has ever been just black and white, but it's been a conversation as if things have been just black and white. And the reality has always been different than what the conversation has been in the mainstream. So, of course, you know, black and white, I think they define the, the ceiling and the floor in terms of race relations, but you've always had discrimination against groups that weren't considered black nor white. Mm -hmm. And I think that's becoming more a part of the conversation that what do we do with this large group of people who are now being defined as other or ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tamar. You wrote in a recent New York Times piece about the Rachel Dolezal case. You said, quote, racial identity cannot be fluid as long as the definition of whiteness is fixed. And historically, the path to whiteness has been extremely narrow. What did you mean by that? Well, one of the things that I wrote in the New York Times piece is about the one drop rule. So the idea historically that anyone with any sort of black ancestry is black no matter how small, small of an amount that ancestry is. And there is a history both socially and legally um, to make sure that those people, people even with white ancestry, don't have a path to whiteness or don't have access to white privilege as long as they have some black ancestry. Well, do white people look at themselves as white or do they have other definition? Uh, about who they are? I think that, well, that's one of the problems. Very often we don't identify white culture. White is the default. So any other kind of culture becomes the other. So it is true that many Americans, many white Americans don't view themselves as white, but it still is. Mm -hmm. and, and to your point that there's a certain privilege that comes with that, that we as black people don't enjoy. Absolutely. Dr. Johnson, how about that? Do we have an extra burden as black people that white people and Rachel Dolezal could never understand? Yes. <laughs> I mean, when someone asks me, how long have I been thinking about race? I'll, I'll say, as long as I've been thinking, right? As long as I can understand what my thoughts are and begin to articulate. And when someone like Rachel begins to say, I am black, um, even if someone says, okay, race is not a social construct, how it, it's been constructed in her life is probably a very different experience when you're coming out of the womb and as you're starting to, you know, learn the most basic lessons from your parents on how to survive, you know, 
that's a different experience mm -hmm. from um, what Rachel may have experienced. Okay. And that's not to essentialize it, but it's to say that race is not this thing that we can just take lightly as you just decide, okay, I'm feeling inadequate in myself. I guess because I have some superficial understanding of what blackness is, I can now claim blackness. Can somebody choose to be black if you want whatever race you want to be? Do we have that choice? Well, first I want to say it's important to acknowledge the history. Right, so there's, there are certain racial categories. We're talking about race as a social construct, mm -hmm. and I think that's you know, well acknowledged at this point, but it's not to say that it doesn't matter. Obviously, right. there's a lot of injustice that's centered around the idea of these social constructs. But at the same time, I mean, I wonder if Rachel Dolezal did what she did because she didn't know how to express herself within the available spaces, if you will. Um, Tamara, in the beginning of your article, you talked about what if Rachel Dolezal had expressed her self as like a white ally to the black community, for example, that would have been a good thing. Um, in communities like Loving Day and other parts of the multiracial community, you know, her interracial relationship, her role um, adopting transracially, and all of these things would have pretty much well qualified her to be a part of the multi-ethnic community without needing to add anything to her identity or the way she expressed it. Tamara, I want to follow up on, does uh, Ms. Dolezal have uh, a choice can she can she be black if she wants and if she uh, if she was open about her racial identity would she be accepted in a black community uh, as uh, one of the uh, pillars and one of the fighters for black cause I think the answer to that is yes well part of this goes back to what we said at the very beginning um, you can't just choose who you are um, Yes, race is a social construct, but so is money, so is time. Our society has decided that those things mean something, and that means that they have a very real impact on people's lives. And the problem with being able to choose, as Rachel Dolezal tried to do, is that someone like me cannot choose. Um, I cannot, as a brown-skinned black woman, hey, I was raised in Indiana, born in the suburbs, well, maybe I feel white. <laughs> that, that's not going to work. No one would accept me. As a matter of fact, for black people who are biracial, think of President Obama. Um, he has a white mother and was raised in a white family. And no one would likely accept him if he decided to say, I identify as a white man. And that is the problem with the idea that we can shift back and forth is because it only works one way. And I think, um, as one of your other guests said, there is a history of white people or non-black people being a part of a multiracial community and working on behalf of anti-racism. As a matter of fact, the founders of the NAACP, the group that she worked for, is also founded in part by white people. So certainly she would have been accepted. Well, we'll take a break from our conversation now to hear some other news from Abby Shula and Sarah Pizan. Week we ask you to tell us what's trending in your community. Here's what we gathered. Sarah, what's buzzing? Vocational schools in the city will be getting an upgrade in the fall after a teacher boot camp over the summer. About a hundred teachers will learn how to adapt their school's programs to include applied science and technology. Teachers in boot camp? <laughs> yeah, Abby, I know it's crazy. Wow. The boot camps will be run by companies like Adobe for graphic art, Apple for Tech Education, the Greater New York Auto Dealer Association for um, Auto Tech, and C Tech for IT Training. So the mayor said this initiative is about making sure that these programs in these vocational schools really target the 21st century job market. And um, so, for example, instead of learning about um, how to use wrenches in an auto mechanics class, students will need to study electric car design. Wow. So how many schools would this affect? So there's about 318 vocational schools in the city right now that cater to 120,000 students. So that's a lot. But now these schools are no longer going to be called vocational schools. They're changing their name to career and technical educational schools. That's great. We wish the teachers the best of luck this summer. Thanks. Hip Hop Public Health is a nonprofit organization that uses the musical genre to teach kids in the inner city about healthy diets. Wow, that's unique. Is this a new organization? Actually
actually, it's not a new organization. They recently celebrated reaching over 7,000 students in New York City through its Hip Hop Heals program. And Heals is an acronym for healthy eating and living in schools. The organization is also working closely with Michelle Obama's Healthy Eating Initiative, um, which is called the Partnership for a Healthier America. Oh, that's so they've great. been doing a lot, yeah. Yeah, so who's behind this organization? Well, it was founded by Nigerian-born um, neurologist mm. Olajide Williams. And basically, back in the 80s, he fell in love with LL Cool J. He fell in love with hip hop, so that's why he's using hip hop as a tool. Cool. But back in 2005, when he was working with Harlem Hospital, mm -hmm. he was working with stroke patients. Hmm. And he wanted a way to teach young people how to detect signs of stroke, early signs of stroke, in their elder relatives. So he teamed up with Dougie Fresh, and they came up with this hip hop initiative for you know teaching kids about stroke. And it actually led to some kids calling 911 and saving the lives of their family members. Nice. So he's taking it a step further with this program, and he's doing quite well with it. For more on that story, head over to VoicesOfNY.org. bed has a lot to offer when it comes to culture. And this summer, a series of monthly gallery walks is going to turn the neighborhood into a destination for art aficionados. That's so cool. I know, right? So cultural centers, galleries, and local businesses are all opening their doors on the first Saturdays of every month from now through October to basically showcase the neighborhood's creativity and talent. But it's not just about art galleries. People can also visit local bars, attend actors' workshop, comedy shows, poetry, jazz, you name it, they have it. It's awesome. Mm, wow. I, you know I live in the neighborhood, so I'll be taking advantage of this. And it, of course, this will help people learn more about the area. That's exactly the point. The organizer, Joseph C. Grant Jr., wants to turn bed into uh, what he calls an artist colony. And rather than doing something once a year, he really wants to do something for a consistent amount of time, so that's why the summer series. So if you'd like to attend um, and find out more, you can go to their Facebook page, bed -Stuy Art Walk, for more details. I'll be checking that out. A 41-year-old daycare and senior center that was once in jeopardy of being shut down may be saved by the state senate. Really? Why was it facing closure? Well, it all goes back to what a lot of people in the city are facing, new landlords, higher rent. Mm. Basically, the building that houses the Swinging 60 Senior Center and Small World Daycare Center, um, their rent got raised by $10,000 by the new landlords. Wow. Yeah. And they were issued an eviction notice on Christmas Eve of 2013. That's cool. Right? So um, activists got involved, they took the issue to court, and they were able to get the Senate to get eminent domain to take over the building. Mm -hmm. So the next step is getting Governor Cuomo to sign this into law wow. by the end of the year. Well, we wish them luck with that. Absolutely. Well, that's it for this week. Be sure to tweet us at IndieSources, hashtag Abby and Sarah. And tell us what's buzzing in your community. Thanks for staying tuned. Professor Johnson, I wanted to go back to a statement you made earlier during our conversation when you said it's never just about black and white. Okay, what do you mean by that? Well, just thinking about race from the earliest point in this country, white people didn't often refer to themselves as white people. They referred to themselves as Protestants, as okay. Christians. Mm -hmm. As the Irish came, they were not considered white. Yes. You know, they had to create these definitions and labels. Uh, we often treat, you know, the Chinese on the West Coast as invisible, but they've been a part of this country's history for a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, we're getting to a point now where we can ignore the diversity. So now we want to have this conversation about what does it mean to be um, black and white in the mainstream, but we've always had those conversations, it just wasn't heard. Uh, on Sunday on Meet the Press, uh, Chuck Todd, I believe was the host now, uh, <laughs> urged people the, the incident in South Carolina was not about race and we need to just like pause on the race dialogue. I mean, is he way off base or does he have a point here? I think most people would disagree with him. Why? Well, just given the context, right? The choice of location, the people who were there, um, I don't think anyone believes that it was random, but, put it that way. But there's a, a good percent, a great percentage of people who share that view. It's, I mean, a lot of, uh, every time there's a racial incident, there's a group that almost denying that race played any role into it. You go back to shooting sprees, we've seen the police on black men. The incident in Texas where this young black woman was really mauled by the cop. And so mm -hmm. are we uh, seeing a racial denial uh, happening here? Yes. <laughs> Short <laughs> answer, yes. <laughs> I mean, I Tom, you're asking me these questions. Let me get, let me get yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, right? 
Yes, I think, you know, at the, at the top of the show, we talked about whether or not um, the racial discussion has changed over the years. It has changed. Um, because, as you said, the profile of the country is changing. However, one thing that hasn't changed is how uncomfortable many of us feel talking about race, and in particular, about racism. And frankly, it feels better for those of us who don't have to deal with race on a daily basis, who are the default, to kind of shove aside the realities of race and racism. There is no way, if you look at um, the manifesto of the shooter in Charleston, the things he said before he committed this heinous act, the place he chose, and to think that has nothing to do with race is absolutely absurd. Dr. Johnson, why is it so difficult for us as Americans to discuss race? Because we have an idea of America as a raceless place. I mean, th this denial is so strong where we'll say that the Civil War was not about race. It was not about slavery. It was about states' rights. And it's like, what are you? It, you have to create an alternate reality to evade the history of the U.S. James Baldwin said it probably most poignantly that there's an essential de, there's an essential feature of the U.S. in which white people have to delude themselves in to, order to believe all the ideals and to understand their own reality other than racism. Ken. Why is it so difficult for us to discuss race? Why is it such a, a raw topic, visceral? Mm. Well, a, a couple of things. One thing that I like about what Rachel Dolezal was saying is that race is more complex than people make it out to be. Mm -hmm. So I think it's not just that it's difficult to talk about, it's also complex. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here with a professor from Brooklyn College, so he can break it down for us, and folks who write op-ed columns for the New York Times, so that's a good thing. You know, but the other thing is that it's not just that it's... Um, complex, but it's uncomfortable. And I think a lot of the conversation today is about how the, it's getting both easier to talk about race and more difficult to talk about race. And that difficulty is kind of a good thing, because we're starting to unpack things like white privilege. And racism is an idea of a, as a systemic problem, rather than the acts of just individuals, like mm -hmm. recent incidents. Mm -hmm. So I think that's all that is positive, even if it is uncomfortable sometimes. Tama, whatever happened to post-racial America? <laughs> what happened to it? It's not here yet. <laughs> it's never, it hasn't gotten here yet. I don't think, I think there's this idea that even in, in liberalism, that the, the, our goal in talking about anti-racism is this colorblind, no race, no culture America. And that's not helpful. It's not our differences that are a problem. It's, how we treat people with differences and how we treat those differences. So there is certainly, until there is not racism, there will not be a post-racial America. And I'm, I'm not so sure that recognizing our differences in cultures is a bad thing anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we deal with the history of, of, of slavery? When you mentioned it earlier, Dr. Johnson, about how there was denial back then mm -hmm. about the Civil War and its intentions. Um, can we ever move beyond the impact of racism in our society and the legacy of it? Not until we deal with it. And mm -hmm. denial is, the, yeah, is, yeah. is not dealing with it. The, the impetus to say that you know, racism is only a thing in your mind or it doesn't have to be an issue unless you make it an issue is, is absurd. It's like saying um, capitalism doesn't exist only in your head, but even if it's just a matter of buying your daughter art supplies to go to school, capitalism is very much a part of the process of buying, buying art supplies and providing the appropriate education. Race works the same way. Even if race is not the central issue, race is always present because our entire society is organized based on race. So when it's not the most pressing thing in a situation, it's still present. And the fact that we can't acknowledge that race is always present is part of our denial. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Ken, uh, you're a multiracial advocate. Uh, what role is the multiracial category pl is playing in this conversation? Expanding it, I'd say, expanding that conversation because the multiracial community is constantly uh, facing certain issues, like being challenged on whether we belong to certain categories or not, um, belonging to certain communities or not. You know, we think about it all the time. 
Um, it's not just in the U.S., it's also happening around the world. Um, I don't know if you heard in March, the new Miss Universe Japan mm -hmm. is, uh, she, her father is, mm -hmm. is black and her mother is Japanese. And that's starting to challenge what it means to be Japanese. And this is something I can relate to because I have Japanese, Japanese. heritage, right? Okay. And uh, even though she's culturally very Japanese, in her own words, she says when the phone rings, she stands up and bows before she answers. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's about as Japanese as it gets, you know? These conversations are expanding. And while I definitely think it's important to acknowledge some of the subjects you're talking about, mm -hmm. history, the injustice, it still goes on. We can't forget about that, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, I remember when Barack Obama was elected, there was sort of a... Oh, there was a lot of joy, but then there was also this idea of like, okay, racism over. Mm -hmm. It's over. The post-racial right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Like, that was when you started to hear about it, right? When he got elected, and it's, that's a dangerous thing to believe. Even though it's a, definitely a step in the right direction, you got to say, okay, we still have some things to work through. It's a good step. Um, one thing I'll also add is I'm optimistic. I hope that one day, it could be many decades or who knows how long, but maybe we'll move past this. Um, there's a guy who was the head of the U.S. Census, um, he said that maybe in the future the, the main sort of social issue will be immigration status if we ever transcend race. So who knows? That's not today. Mm -hmm. And Tom, are you as optimistic uh, as Ken about the uh, breakdown of a racial structure? I am cautiously optimistic. How is that? <laughs> well, I, think the, I think the conversation is getting better. Um, but there are still so many barriers, but I am cautiously optimistic. All right. Mm -hmm. So when we come back, we'll get some final thoughts from our panelists. Thanks for staying tuned. Dr. Johnson, are you optimistic about race relations in the United States? No, not optimistic. And um, I'm a fairly optimistic person, but when it comes to race, I feel like if you just read history, um, there's been so many more progressive periods in which race was a conversation. Um, you talk about the 1930s, 1960s, 1970s, and then now you have a period where the, the, the black person would be the person who you would probably expect, right or wrong, to go in there and articulate a voice, a reason about race. Now you have a person who will say, this is not a race issue, this is a faith issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very um, sim symptomatic of where we are in terms of race that is so easy to deny. And I think that denial is something that doesn't allow us to really engage on what it means to be transracial or post-racial because ultimately that entails that the structure itself has to change. And we don't even touch the structure. We touch on individuals and why they did right and wrong things and not interrogate the very reality in which these things are allowed to happen. Uh, this is a question I'd like each one of you to uh, weigh in on. Uh, well, I'll start with Tamara. As, have we regressed in terms of racial relations since Barack Obama was elected? I don't know if it's regression so much that being confronted with the first black biracial president has forced a lot of things to come up that were there all the time, that were kind of hidden just below the surface. And so being confronted with this manifestation for how the country is changing has caused a lot of turmoil. So I'm not sure if it's regression so much as part of the process of moving forward, maybe. Okay. Ken? I actually agree with Tamara. It's, I would express it the same way. It doesn't feel good sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. like all this stuff, as you're saying, this turning up to the surface, it makes for an uncomfortable conversation. But in my mind, that's progress. Um, Lawrence and I were talking before the show uh, about how some of these news items in some ways are just sort of reinforcing old ideas. Mm -hmm. And it's important to, to not just do that. I mean, you have to do that because it acknowledges the injustices that are still happening today. But at the same time, you've got to add new layers to that conversation and, and move it forward. And I think that's where the hope, the, op the cautious optimism lies. Well, there, there you go. You were the pessimist among your colleagues here. Uh, so. Mm -hmm. I think progress is part of the ideology 
that makes us think that race is getting better. And I don't think that's the case. And um, I, don't, I don't even know what progress means. I, I can look at, um, since Barack Obama has been elected, the wealth gap having more than doubled between blacks and whites, and it's not a conversation we're having, and the impact on real people's lives aren't really being discussed in terms of a lack of resources. It becomes the question of how does Rachel identify as opposed to how many people die simply from um, poor health care, which the health care bill does not address the very systemic issues that create the disparities in the first place. So I'm pessimistic, and I think progress is part of the um, idea that we started at some place and things are continuously getting better where if it's history uh, tells us anything, every time we make some progress it goes back. It's more of a zigzag throughout history. Let me get n not academic or not intellectualized <laughs> in, in some sense. Um, I'm in an interracial relationship. Mm -hmm. My kids have all kinds of friends, Asians, mm -hmm. Latinos, African Americans, all of that. When I grew up, all my friends were black. I didn't have any white friends. So is that what I'm seeing that? Explain to me what that is. Um, I think it's a recent development where it's at least legal. <laughs> but, um, it's been legal for quite some time. But <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, so it depends on where we situate ourselves in history. But even when we look at interracial relationships, we still see a, a regular pattern of who's marrying who. Um, mm -hmm. The highest rate of intermarriage is um, white men, Asian women. Uh, the lowest rate of um, interracial relationships is um, black women, white men. And I think it tells us something about our but racial But that's recent, though. That's recent, because mm -hmm. there was a time mm -hmm. it was uh, reverse. It was mm -hmm. black women and white men getting married were more so than any other mix. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I'll throw in something on that note. Uh, so Richard and Mildred Loving, whose case Loving versus and, and Virginia, Virginia right? yes, I, I'm for, very Which familiar with them. Made that uh, interracial marriage legal in the right. United States. When they got married around 1958, according to uh, a Gallup poll, it was a four percent acceptance of interracial marriage in the United States. When they got uh, when they won their case in 1967, it was more like 20 percent, and today it's more like 87 percent. And by the way, your organization is named after that couple, right? Exactly. Loving Day, <laughs> named after the anniversary of the case. So that's progress, but it's not 100% progress, right? Okay. And there's definitely at some fronts where there's not enough progress. Mm -hmm. uh, the socioeconomic divide is one place. Mm -hmm. I mean, my reaction when I saw the Rachel Dolezal thing was like, why don't we talk about why black women earn 64 cents on the dollar compared to white men? Mm -hmm. Why isn't that the trending topic? Mm -hmm. You know, Rachel Dolezal, it's fun to pile up on her or whatever, but... <laughs> There are more important things. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. And unfortunately, we have to leave this conversation here. I'd like to thank our guests, Tamara Winfrey Harris, Ken Tanabe, and Dr. Lawrence Johnson for being part of our great discussion this week. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.